afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, George Radney, Chelsea Community News. How you doing, Coach Frazier? I'm doing fine, George. Thanks. Get my there we go. Now, modern technology. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> question uh, for you. Watch the Miami game last night. It, it seemed like they, they doing what they call a press coverage, what looks like the old bump and run from back in the day. That's what it looked like to me, what they were calling it press coverage. Uh, so it, it seems like a timing. Uh, were you uh, having to see where some, some, certain quarterbacks to a like the uh, their timing quarterback, they're more efficient on timing rather than uh, rather than other options. Yeah, you're you're right. There's some some offenses uh, that rely on timing in their passing game, and you know the disruption by the corners when they are able to get the hands on the receivers and disrupt that timing can affect uh, some of those type of offenses and. Uh, you, you need to have the personnel to get that done, but that's one one of the ways to disrupt uh, a, a time in offense. Is there, is there a reason why more, more teams just don't do that, not only on the timing quarterbacks, but just in general? Why wouldn't they just uh, bump the receiver for those five yards and then you have to release them uh, without getting a penalty? Yeah, you know, I, I think some teams do try it, uh, and some of it has to do with your personnel. You know, can we get our hands? on that receiver to disrupt the timing between here and the quarterback. And if you don't feel like you have the guys that can get out there and do it, then you, you know, you play a different style, but I agree with you. I mean, that's a good way of trying to do it, trying to disrupt the timing as much as you can. Okay. Last question. Uh, DeMar Hamlin, he seems to play so much better with Jordan Poyer on the field with him. Uh, is that just the veteran leadership of Jordan Poyer coming through on uh, DeMar Hamlin? It definitely helps uh, having Jordan on the field, I think helps our entire defense, uh, especially our secondary, but for sure, uh, Jordan's presence, his leadership, George, uh, his playmaking ability, all of that uh, just increases everybody's confidence on our defense. So it's great when we have him back on, on, on the field. Great. Thank you very much and good luck this coming weekend. Thank you. Hi, Coach. Um, last hey. week, you, last week you said um, you explained why Kair was inactive. Um, this week he was active but didn't see the field. Can you give us some insight into, you know, your thought process to why he didn't play and what's going on at the cornerback two position? Yeah, he, uh, Kair had a good week of practice for us, Sal, and, and, and we were thinking about and had intentions of getting him in the ball game. But the way the game was going, the way Dane was playing, uh, we just let it ride the way, the way it was going. And it worked out for our team. Uh, but uh, we do want to get him some snaps, and we'll see where it goes this, this coming week. Uh, he's been practicing well and, and continues to make an improvement. Uh, but Dane was doing a good job for us yesterday, and uh, so we, we let it stay to where it was. And I just want to congratulate you on being inducted into the 2023 Black College Football Hall of Fame. That's quite an honor. Um, I know that um, obviously there's a lot of people that you'd probably want to thank when that happens, but um, if you can try to just reflect on your career and you know, getting to this point, what it means to you and have that honor. Yeah, you know, when I got the call, Sal, that was a, a special moment, man. It really uh, touched me. Uh, James Shaq Harris, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, former Buffalo Bill and great uh, NFL quarterback and uh, Gremlin State University alumnus, uh, gave me the call. And, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a young kid growing up and then going to college, I wasn't really thinking about Hall of Fame, anything like that. I was just trying to make the team and eventually win a starting job and to uh, get that call and to realize so many greats that are already in the Hall of Fame, in the Black College Hall of Fame, uh, it's just very humbling. Uh, a lot of people think because whenever you achieve an honor like that, it's never just about you. And I had some terrific coaches when I was in college at Alcorn, uh, Coach Marino Chasm, my head football coach, and, and many others that touched me along the way. but a very humbling uh, moment uh, when I was informed of that news. And can I just ask, why did you choose Alcorn when you went there? Um, when I was coming out of school, so it was just when things were beginning to turn as far as integration is concerned. Um, I, I went to Alcorn in 1977. And at the time, uh, people of my color, it wasn't, you, you, it wasn't as abundant today uh, as it is today to get into uh, some of the local schools in my area, I grew up in Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi States, the Ole Miss, the Alabama. So it was 
it wasn't like it is today. And um, so when I was recruited, I you know actually visited Ole Miss. I grew up about 15 minutes from Mississippi State. The people from Alcorn, the coaches who recruited me, when they came down and talked to me and my, my family, uh, my grandmother who raised me, they were just uh, so welcoming and uh, and just treated us so good. And then when I went to visit Alcorn and went to watch one of their games and watch the band, the atmosphere, and I was like, man, I kind of like this. You know, I this is this is I'm a, I'm a, this is where I want to go to school. And and I, I made the decision to go to Alcorn. It was a, a, a great decision for me. Good stuff. Thanks, Coach. Congratulations again. Thank you. Hi, Leslie. Um, it's it's the more things change, the more things stay the same. It's Levi Wallace moved on to uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, now Dane Jackson's played more than snaps a cornerback than anybody for you guys this year. And it seems like we continue to have this, at least in fan and media circles, this cornerback to debate whether or not Dane's playing well enough to have that job. And obviously the the element of Kyer Elam being a first round draft pick kind of changes the conversation a little bit, but. I know you talked about it with Sal a minute ago, but like, can you take us a little bit more deeper into that whole dynamic? Because there seems to be a level of satisfaction on your end as a coaching staff with what you're seeing of Dane Jackson, as opposed to maybe some frustrations in the fan base. Yeah. Um, you know, Dane has done some, some good things for us. Uh, as you recall, Maddie stepped in uh, when Tredavis was injured a season ago and really took over that role uh, full time after that Thanksgiving game against New Orleans. And, uh, did a really good job for us down the stretch. And he's done some good things for us here in 2022 as well. And Kair has made progress. He played a lot for us early on. And we do want to get him back in the rotation. And that's, that's the goal, uh, you know, going forward. And as I mentioned earlier, we were thinking about doing that even yesterday. That, that was the goal. He had done a really good job in practice. Uh, we want to bring him along and continue to grow him. Uh, but we also know that we're going to need Dane as well. Uh, you know, now that we have Tre Davis back and hopefully stays healthy the remainder of the season, but we want Dane to continue to progress also. So being able to play the both of them, uh, we think is a good thing for us. And, you know, we'll see how things go in, in, uh, when we get ready to play Miami. Um, obviously, Garrett Wilson has had such a, uh, a great rookie season. Tredavious playing 100% of the snaps yesterday. How did you see him hold up, especially, you know, the parts of the game where you had him kind of traveling a little bit with, with Garrett, if that was the plan that you guys employed and just how Trey played overall. Yeah, you know, it was good to have him back uh, where you didn't have to have him on a pitch count. Just let him go out and play and, and get a chance to experience a full game. So that was really encouraging. And he had some good moments in that game. And there were some moments where you you, you kind of know that he's not quite where, back where he wants to be. And I don't even know if we'll see uh, that level of play that we've seen from Trey Davis uh, this season, because usually, man, it takes a full season plus one to really get back to where you were. Uh, but I thought he did, did a lot of good things yesterday that really encourages us as a staff uh, that he's back to being that guy that we can count on and trust. Uh, so overall, I thought he did a really good job. I guess a, a good young receiver. Um, is even that that level of Trey White still better than most? I would say so. I think uh, me and the coaching staff, John Butler, our, our secondary coach, and, and Jimmy Salgado, uh, that's how we feel. I mean, he's he's still very, very good, uh, even though he's still recovering from a, you know major knee surgery. He's still really, really good as a player, and, and that's one of the reasons we felt comfortable uh, matching him uh, with Garrett yesterday. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, a lot of personalities on that defensive line. Uh, where do you see Daquan Jones fitting into that mix? Bad Jacks about Daquan, John. He, uh, you know, he's the guy who's kind of, he's a really low key, quiet guy off the field, doesn't say a whole lot, but he has been so consistent for us uh, throughout this season. Uh, very good play down in and down out and kind of like an unsung hero. He had some, some really good plays in the run game yesterday for us. Uh, some pressure on the quarterback, uh, but he doesn't always get those splash plays that the fans kind of see and, and, and look for, but he's been really steady. He's been great in the classroom with our young players, and he's been a guy that we can count on. So uh, really pleased and happy that we have him on our defense. He's been really good for us throughout the season. We know the juice with Shaq and Ed and, and the personalities again, but is it good to have almost like the calming low-key force 
that is a guy like Daquan to, to even things out when, when things maybe get a little uh, choppy? I think it is because, he, you know, Ed, you've been around Ed. I mean, he's a gregarious guy. He's outgoing. And so is Shaq. I mean, when those guys walk in the room, Tim Settle, you know they're in the room. Whereas Daquan, he kind of sneaks in low key. Uh, but he has all the respect in the world of his teammates. They love him. Uh, they respect him. And when he speaks, they listen. And so it's good to have that balance. A guy with some experience, uh, you know, who's, who's had a lot of success in our league, uh, but yet he doesn't have to be the center of attention. And so I think that does kind of balance some of the other personalities that we have in that room. Thanks, Leslie. You're welcome. Coach Frazier, Mookie Hawkins, Waffle Sports Cincinnati. How you doing today, sir? Doing good, Mookie. Doing good. Yes, and uh, man, congratulations on your induction uh, to the Black College Hall of Fame, man. What a great way to continue your legacy there. Thanks, man. Thank you. Coach, on third and long situations as of late, the opposition is still converting with seven guys in coverage. Where do you think the problem lies? Is it lack of communication or guys are just out of alignment? Well, we weren't so good yesterday on third and seven plus, man. We <laughs> we got them into a, a lot of third and longs and we didn't win enough of them. We won some, we didn't win enough. We needed to win more. Um, and, you know, we got to uh, make sure that we get our rushing coverage working together. And then when we bring pressure, being able to win when we, when we bring pressure. But it's an area uh, where we need to improve and we're going to need to be better uh, this week against Miami. Uh, when you get a team into those long yardage situations on third down, you need to get off the field. And uh, we didn't do that enough. We, 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 we won nine different times and uh, there were some other times where we didn't win, where we need to win. Absolutely, Coach. And, and with San Fran and, and Los Angeles the past couple of weeks, obviously they've been going press man versus number 10. Now, I think that you had the antidote at week three by using Kyrie versus the Cheetah, and he only held him to two catches in 33, in 33 yards in that game. Uh, what do Kyrie need to do, or what do you need to see out of him this week in practice so he can see the field Saturday? Well, you know, I spoke with him earlier today, Monkey, and I just explained to him, just keep working as hard as you've been working and just keep your head up. His opportunities are going to come, and he's been practicing well. He's been doing a really good job in the meetings, and, uh, you know, his opportunities are going to come. He just has to be patient. Uh, we still got a lot of football left. I know for some on the outside, it doesn't seem that way, uh, but these games are the most critical games of our season. No, no one more important than this one. So as long as he stays focused on the matter at hand, uh, and then when his opportunity comes, take advantage of it. Absolutely, Coach. And you've been spot on, man, especially with the run blitzing. And, you know, I think that kind of stymied the Jets' attack there in that second half. Here to talk about being comfortable to call those type of blitzes with Milano and Edmonds out there. Yeah, it, it's – Mookie, you could do it with those two guys blitzing. <laughs> you'd feel comfortable too. <laughs> Matt Milano and Tremaine Edmonds, man, they they can bring it. And uh, you want to call their numbers often when you when you can. And we're very fortunate to have the both of them. Uh, but they are very good at, in coverage. But you know as well as I do how good they are at blitzing as well. So it's not that hard, Mookie, to, to send those two, believe me. Absolutely. You definitely know. Got two dogs in that in the middle of that defense. Have a great week of practice, coach, and good luck Saturday night. Thank you. Hey, Leslie, Mike, the NFL Network. How are you? Hey, Mike. Doing good. Um, you mentioned Milano when we know he doesn't love to talk very much. Uh, I was talking to Tremaine last week, and he just said part of their relationship on the field is that unseen thing. Or, you, know, the, the, you don't even have to speak. You just look at the guy. He knows what you're going to do. What sort of flexibility and freedom does that give you knowing that you have two guys who know your defense so well and communicate so well sometimes without even using words? I tell you, Mike, it, um, it makes my job, along with Bobby Babbage, our linebackers coach job, so much easier because of their experience and how much time they played together. And that was a play we were watching on tape this morning in that ball game where we, we had called the pressure and it was designed for Matt to go but something happened during the play where they just kind of looked at each other and Tremaine went instead. And it's, it's an example of what you're talking about, just the symmetry between the two of them. And yet we were still able to function defensively. We got exactly done what we wanted to get done, but it was, a, it was an adjustment within the defense that would not have been made if that were say two young guys out there on that linebacker or uh, maybe Tremaine and another guy, but because it's Matt and Tremaine and they've been together for so long, I mean, they made it work, and I was like, wow, 
I mean, that's the value of those two guys playing together. Sure. Um, and I wanted to get back to Tredavious White a little bit. And, you know, there was obviously you were trying to ramp him up physically, having not played for as long as he did. And then he goes to 100 percent of the snaps yesterday. But how much of the work that you have to do with him mentally to sort of build up his confidence that, hey, you're this guy, you can be this guy again. I, you know, I, I, it's a, I mean, you went through it. You, you ripped up your knee. The surgery procedures, unfortunately for you, they're better now than they, than they were when you played. But I'm just curious how much work you had to do in that part of it. Yeah, that's a good question because that is a big part of it. It's not just the physical, you know, taking snaps in practice, but are you mentally ready to go out and play a whole game and, and have the confidence and mental toughness to battle back through uh, some adversity because you're going to face some adversity at the corner position. And I think John Butler, our, our defensive back coach, did a really good job and has done a good job throughout the week and leading up to the game where he, he was going to get, you know, all the snaps. Uh, really helping to boost his confidence. Of course, I'm talking to him and Sean is talking to him and encouraging him as well. But John did a really good job uh, really spending time with him away from the meetings, away from practice, and just talking to him about where he was currently and, and, and how far he had come from uh, back in training camp through the season. So, uh, it, you know, kudos to Trey for going out there, performing as well as he, he did uh, in his First full exposure in a game. He did a great job. Thank you, Leslie. Well. Hey, Leslie. Um, I was curious. We've talked a lot about rotating at that, especially the second cornerback spot and all of that throughout the season. When you're in a game situation and you're like, should we be switching out? Should we be rotating? What are those conversations like mid-game? Because you don't have a lot of time to really talk about it. Like, what's that like on the sideline? Yeah, Elena. So, you know. We're communicating in between series and sometimes during the series, but usually in between. And John Butler, our defensive back coach, uh, in this case, you know, we're talking in between and just say, how's Dane doing? Uh, what do you think things are? What does it look like? And the way the game was going yesterday, you know, for the most part, we had things in control for the most part. And we just kind of let it go as it was. And that's not always the case. Uh, you know, we have a plan going into the game, but sometimes the the game and, and, and the emotions of the game can dictate what direction you should go. And then I just wanted to follow up on Trey for you, um, having seen the journey kind of he's gone through to see him. I know you said he's not going to, he's still got to ramp up and all that to play at the level we, you know, he can, but to see him play a hundred percent of the snaps and after a year of, you know, the rehab, just what was that like after you saw the, what he did to get back on the field? Uh, just uh, so overjoyed uh, for him and knowing how hard he's worked to get to this point, how much time he put in, the hours and hours. And, and, and as Mike mentioned earlier, the, the mental stress of trying to get back on the field to go play four quarters in an NFL game. So just uh, elated for him and his family to see that. And I, I really believe it'll just get better and better from this point on, because that's a big hurdle to go out and play four quarters. That's something he hadn't done in, in over a year so. Uh, that's just one more step that he had to get past, and that should help him going forward. And then on a completely different note, I wanted to ask you about Greg. We talk about, like, he's obviously playing well and, you know, taking steps forward and all that. But I was curious, off the field, how much have you seen Greg kind of develop since last year? Like, how much is Greg, I don't know, speaking more? Or what's he like kind of off the field um, from his rookie year? He's grown so much, Elena, and it's, it's a really good question regarding Greg because, you know, obviously he's, his play has improved uh, from his first to his second year, but his maturation off the field, you can see it. Eric Washington, our defensive line coach, uh, has an exercise that he does with his players uh, during the week. And I happened to be in their meeting last week, and he had a few different players just to talk about the Jets' offensive line, what style of offense they run, what are some of their top runs, what are some of their top passes, how do the guards, the tackle set. And I listened to Greg as he was reading his notes, and I was like, wow, this guy, man, he sounds like he could be a coach. I mean, his description and how detailed it was, you could tell that he's watched so much tape and the way he was able to articulate his facts. I was just so, so impressed. But uh, that gives you an example of how much growth there's been. That wouldn't have happened his rookie year, you know, you probably wouldn't expect that to happen, but for him to be as detailed and as explicit as he was uh, in his description of their offense, just uh, very, very impressed. Because that tells you it's not just a physical talent, 
there's a lot going on from the neck and above. And that that's what takes you to the next level when you've been gifted with a certain amount of athletic ability. When you can think the game as well, you have a chance to become a great player in this league. Okay, quick follow up to that. Sorry. I, do you see that then? Like things like that? Do you think that like, do you see that directly impacting his play on the field? Like are there things he's also doing on the field that you're like, oh, he's picking up like these details and stuff. And I see that also like translating on the field directly. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, there, there are details that he's picking up from tape and, and sending the meetings with Coach Washington, who's you know the best defensive line coach in our league, uh, and taking it to the grass. A lot of guys can't do that. I mean, they get in the classroom, but they don't necessarily, necessarily translate it to their play. Greg is able to do that. When you, when you give him a tip or you give him some information, he can put that into action on the field. And those are the guys that become really, really good players in our league. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, I know you talked so much already today about Tredavious White, but wanted to follow up one more time on him. It sounds like there's maybe a fine line of, you know, you guys want to build up that confidence, but also you mentioned like it's not realistic necessarily for him to be 100% who he was pre-injury at this point right now. So how do you balance, you know, helping him even, he told us, when he talked to us a while ago that he hasn't been through something like this, how do you get him in that exact space of play your game, be confident, but don't feel like you have to do too much right now? Well, Catherine, that's, that's the conversation with, with what you just said. Uh, you know, you're, you're making sure that those expectations are realistic. In his mind, he wants to be that Pro Bowl corner he was prior to the injury. And that's going to come, uh, but it's a process and it takes time. There are certain things he just hasn't, done uh, for a long period of time. There are certain muscles that haven't been fired uh, in a situation where you just got to react. It's a little bit different when you're working with a trainer off to the side or you're in practice where things are scripted to be in a game situation where, you know, it's unscripted and you got to react to situations. The only way you get that is through experience and time. So uh, just trying to set realistic expectations for him and making him aware that even where he is right now, he's still better than a lot of corners in our league. And he's very, very valuable, valuable to us right where he is and, uh, and, and letting him know how important he is to our success as a defense, uh, even though his standard uh, of excellence is very, very high. And that's all right. You know, he's going to strive to get to that point. Uh, but it's, it's a process and it takes a little time. Is that when he's so competitive, is it harder when he's playing more to kind of hit that balance of, you know, don't do too much right now. If that makes sense, now that he's playing more, do you have to reiterate it prior to a few weeks ago? I don't. I don't know if we have to uh, really kind of rein him back, anything like that. Uh, other than just making him aware uh, within the scheme, this is what the expectations are, and go out and do the very best that you can within the scheme, and uh, not that we have to rein him back or pull him back in any way. Just just go play and we just keep learning from each experience and keep growing from it. I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's all today. Thanks, Leslie. Okay, Kelly. Thank you.